Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Main Courses here on Uncle Ted's Recipes. Today we've got an interesting one. In a way, it's somewhat similar to the last main course that I did, in that you can kind of just make it in a big pot. It's good to sort of ladle into, you know, a big dish, and it will last you for like, uh, say, three meals and a three dinners and a lunch or four meal, four dinners and a small snack if you're just making it for yourself. Or you can make it last to like four or five servings if you're doing it for a dinner party. So this is a good thing to make in bulk, again, much like the chili con carne that I did in the last video on this channel. So let's get into the ingredients promptly. Now, of course, the main centerpiece of this uh, recipe, which, as you can probably judge by the title, is a nice bit of meat. Now... This recipe is kind of based partly off of cachalet, which of course is a very popular Belgian kind of stew. Very, very nice. Contains a lot of nice chicken sometimes and a good bit of sausage, some pork, beans. It's a very, very nice recipe. But this is kind of like a bit of a faux pas sort of version of that whole thing. So what we're going to be using is we're just going to be using some uh, simple pork sausages here. Uh, there's about eight here, but we're only going to really need about six for this kind of recipe. Uh, then we've got a nice packet of like boneless uh, chicken fillets, sort of um, such. Um, we're probably going to use up all of that. I say get about uh, half a kilo to 600 grams of boneless chicken. That's probably a good enough amount for this kind of recipe. Then uh, just a small punnet of uh, baby chestnut mushrooms or. If you want, you can use miniature portobello mushrooms. I would prefer to go for the baby chestnut ones. They, they're quite sort of got that slightly earthy-ish sort of taste. And um, I don't see them used that much in sort of Belgian-style cooking. But at the same time, they're pretty nice nonetheless. I'd say probably get about 100 to 200 grams of that. Then 400 grams of cannellini beans. A uh, bit of seasoning. I've got a roasting herb mix here from Sainsbury's, as you can see there. Uh, in that we've got a nice bit of, um, uh, let's see, what's it got here? We've got a nice bit of uh, rosemary, some thyme, and a couple of sage leaves. Um, I'd probably more often than not go for bay leaves over sage leaves, but if you don't have bay leaves, sage leaves are a good substitute. Then got some nice green runner beans, good for getting a bit of vitamins in there. Um, one or two medium-ish size white or brown onions, about two or three, I'd say three rather, cloves of, uh, reasonably large cloves of garlic, got some pepper, some nice, just very simple black pepper, it doesn't have to be very exquisite, but just as long as it's decent enough quality. Again, nice bit of table sea salt, and then just to bulk out the whole recipe and give it that extra oomph. It's got some nice mini potatoes there. We're just going to probably do something like just uh, ch cut them up into quarters or something like that and sort of saute them with the onions and garlic at the beginning. And then probably the thing that all the lads out there are going to be looking forward to is a nice bottle Belgian ale. Now, Devel here is a really, really good brand of Belgian ale. You can usually find it in most supermarkets. I got this in the local Sainsbury's. This is a really, really, really nice Belgian ale. Definitely pick this up if you're thinking of doing this recipe because it is just the one for it. You only really need one bottle here of about 330 millilitres. That's really all you need. Not too much, just enough to make one nice reasonably sized stew so that's pretty much all we're going to really need there's of course going to be you know a bit of um olive oil and um that's really it to be honest now the utensils you're going to need for this again like last time i'm going to be using that blue pot that blue metal um that blue cast iron pot i used in the last uh episode of this show you again you can use a stainless steel pot if you want it doesn't matter too much just so long as it's uh roughly around the size of um Roughly around the size of this pot I've got here. Oh, nothing to worry about, so don't worry. Uh, so yeah, roughly around the size of this kind of pot here. And you're also going to need a metal tray, a metal baking tray with some tin foil uh, wrapped over it, because that's what how we're going to prepare the sausages at first. Then of course, as you can see here, a nice cutting board, a wooden spoon, a small knife to uh, cut up the meat with. Uh, preferably a bit sharper than this, but a smaller one like this would probably do. And then you've got a nice big knife for getting grips with and chopping up the vegetables. 
So that's really all you'll need, to be honest. Um, you also probably need a sieve maybe for drowning, uh, sorry, not drowning, draining the cannellini beans and the potatoes once you've washed those. So uh, probably get one of those as well, or a colander if you don't have a... Uh, a sieve and really that's what you kind of need for this recipe it's a very again it's a very nice easy one it's slightly less healthy than the uh, chili con carne but uh, it's it's a pretty good one nonetheless if you want to make it in bulk so let's get on to the method of this but first one point I should make out is that um, before you do anything one thing you should do is re is preheat your oven to about 250 degrees and on the metal tray with the foil on it one here as you can see here now what we're going to do with that is we are going to take uh, six of these sausages here and we're just going to pierce about four or five holes in each of those sausages place them on the tray and then have them cook for about 30 minutes 25 30 minutes or so um, and just so to get them cooked in order to place them straight into the stew. Might want to cook them for slightly less time if you're doing it at 250 degrees, maybe about 20 minutes, but at the same time it's just to get them sort of that initial bit cooked um, because we're just going to be chucking them straight in. Whereas with the chicken, what we're going to try and do with that is we're going to try and slow cook it in the stew in order to get it a bit more broken up, a bit more... Um, finer if you will and just hope it absorbs the flavor a bit more so we're going to get onto that now and just before we get on to it doing anything else off camera i'll just quickly get about six of these sausages prick them and just put them in the oven on the foil tray so we'll get back together after i've just done that okay so now that we've gotten the uh the sausages on cooking in the oven and they've been cooking for a while now so they'll probably need to come out soon we'll just get on to preparing the onions which if you guys of course watched the uh last episode where i made chili con carne you'll probably remember how i did this i mean just keeping the root uh keep the root intact cut off any bad bits of course like this nice little bit of black flesh here uh, uh duh, duh, duh. And just peel off the skin, bit by bit. There you go. There you go. Alright. I've got I'm gonna use two onions for this recipe, I think. And then you just get this black bit here, you slice that off. I would definitely not recommend eating those slightly ghastly looking bits on the onions, they're not very nice. Uh then again last time take the onion and then you just cut it like that keeping the root intact we messed it up a little bit here but um, just cut lengthways up to the root don't cut uh, over the root if you do just slightly don't worry about it too much but just try not try to avoid it as much as you can and just sideways like Again, this might be a little less uh, cost efficient than some methods of cutting up onions, but it's a lot more time saving and it's also a lot safer to do it as well, like I said last time. Uh, so we're just going to do that to the other two halves of onion that we have. And again, if there's any little bits left around the root that you can save, just nip them off like that. Um, and again, like last time, just before you start cutting up the onions and um, preparing the garlic if you are using garlic, uh, heat your um, saucepan up to a very, very low heat, very, very low heat, with a small bit of oil in it, because um, we don't want to start an oil fire. I mean, you do have to preheat it just a small bit, but not very much, and again, just a tiny bit and be sure to add in a good fair amount of oil when you're making this recipe so that you don't immediately burn your house down um of course it's a bit stupid really to heat a pan with oil in it before you've added anything in but just so long as you keep it extremely low heat and that it's not too big of a fire and that you cut up your onions and your potatoes and your garlic quick enough before anything does sort of catch a flame then you should be all right so what we're going to do now as last time just going to chuck the onion in to the uh heating up oil and 
uh, enjoy. Now what I'm going to do is keep blooming god those onions are really strong they're slightly stronger than the ones i used in the uh chili con carne episode actually so what i'm going to do like last time just chucking a bit of salt into here, into the onions and just give them a quick little stir just so you can sort of mix it around in the oil a little bit and just leave that to simmer for a bit unfortunately i did burn myself actually when i put the sausages into the oven in order to let them sort of uh, bake for a bit before uh, chopping them up. But um, if uh, if you do that, just run your hand under a cold tap for several minutes and um, you should be all right. If you've got significantly burn, like there's a massive gash in your hand, probably best to seek medical treatment. Um, so next what we're gonna do, is we're gonna just prepare the garlic. Now I've got a couple of ways of preparing garlic here. One is you, um, you get the little sort of knobbly sort of bit here and you kind of just get your fingernails in there and just peel away from that bit. Now you might end up pe tearing away a bit of the uh, bottom bit of the uh, clove of garlic. It's not the end of the world. And this kind of is a bit more time efficient than the method I'm about to show you guys. Um, but at the same time it's not the most efficient overall. So. What I'm going to do for my method is, again, go to this little knobbly bit here, not the root bit here, but this bit here, and just place your knife slightly over the end, and then using it as a lever, you sort of peel off the uh, skin there, like that. You just keep the knife held down, and then just peel off the skin like that. And you cut off a little bit of the garlic flesh, but uh, like I said, try and keep it as close to the tip of the uh, clove of garlic as you possibly can in order to save as much of the garlic flesh as possible and that way you're done undusted and I'm just, I'll just show you guys that again for the other clove this method is also quite time efficient to be fair and it's uh, probably going to waste as much garlic as well to be honest if you're not careful but just again just um, very sort of close to the edge and there you go that creates a nice little easy lever with which to peel off most if not all of the rest of the uh, skin that remains on the clove of garlic. I would probably recommend using three cloves, if not four, for this recipe, but two is fine enough, and if you're really not squeamish, then I would probably just recommend one. I'd say garlic is preferable to this recipe, and if you really, really massively don't like garlic, you can just use one. I suppose you could just use none at all if you're not willing but then again it kind of takes away from a bit of the flavour I think. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get the wider bit of the knife at the base near the hilt of it here. Just going to get our palm onto that and just going to squash it down. And this is basically what I do when I don't have a garlic crusher, I just do that. Try not to do it near to the top of the blade because then you have a slightly easier chance of accidentally clasping the front of the blade and cutting yourself so better to do it near the base of the blade where it's a bit flatter. Again, see, nice and crushed. Yeah, again, keep your other hand clasped on the hilt as well, just so it doesn't slip and slash yourself. Then, once you've crushed that garlic, you just kind of use it like you'd use on a uh, bit of seasoning and just. There you go. Very simple, very nice and easy, very quick way of preparing your garlic. Now what I'm going to do is after the uh, onion has had about three to five minutes of just simmering a little bit in that salt and oil. Oh there, dear, that onion is really starting to make me water. You just chuck it, you just chuck the onion then into the, um, the, sorry, the garlic into the onion. And again, just give it a little bit of a stir. God, it's making me feel like I've watched the um, Lion King in uh, death scene again for the first time really starting to make water. Those onions are brutally strong that I'm using. Blech. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, that's probably going to take the longest amount of time to cook, next to the meats and stuff, is probably the potatoes. I won't show you the whole process of preparing these because uh, you won't need me to show you the entirety of it, but um, it's pretty simple. Basically, I've got here a bag of about 
let's see, about 750 grams of just sort of new potatoes or miniature potatoes. Just take about two thirds of these potatoes. Um, right. You can use all of them if you want to for this recipe, but I'm just going to use probably about two thirds of them. Uh, there you go. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to wash them after we've cut them up because they're such small potatoes we might as well just leave that until after you've tied, diced them up. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, again if there's any nasty bits you just whip them off or just uh, wean them off with the uh, with the um, blunt side of the knife. Or And then uh, when you've done that you just cut them in half, cut them into quarters, that's it. And then what we're going to do is we're then just going to, after we've done all of these into quarters, we are just going to place them into a sieve or colander where we'll just quickly rinse them all in a bit of cold water just to get the starch out and just to clean them a bit. And then we'll chuck them into the onion and garlic where they can saute a fair bit in order to get them softened up before adding in the uh, the ale and the other vegetables and the chicken and sausage and all that stuff. So. I'll just leave you guys for a second while I just cut up the rest of these potatoes and rinse them and I'll be back in a second. Okay, so now that we've taken a short little interlude, we're just going to prepare the rest of the vegetables, which is pretty much at this point just the um, mushrooms and the green beans. Now what I did after I cut up all those potatoes into little quarters and halves, I just put them in a colander or a sieve and then just rinse them in some cold water quickly for just a minute or two then just chuck them straight into the onions and garlic and then place the lid back on to leave it to sort of wilt and simmer for about 10 or so minutes. Um, again, just at a very, very low heat, not too high at all. Now, these mushrooms are quite small, so we're probably not really going to need to do uh, that much preparation, if anything, that's all for them. Uh, if they're, like, even like this slightly larger one here, if they're about this size, you don't really need to uh, sort of worry about cutting them up too much. So I'm just going to put these straight into the uh, sieve. They're probably going to more so, uh, more so than the potatoes and garlic. Those kind of, uh, those mushrooms are probably more so going to sort of uh, soak, uh, sort of poach a bit in the uh, ale and uh, um, tomatoes when I add them in. But, uh, in fact, actually, I did forget to mention at the beginning. I'll put this in the video description below. But another ingredient I forgot to mention is. A tin of tin tomatoes. My, maybe two, but preferably just one uh, 400 gram of uh, chopped up tin tomatoes. Sorry, I did forget to mention that at the beginning. I'm going to put that in the video description below. Um, so basically for the uh, green beans here, again, it's just pretty simple to be honest. Um, you just chop them, just, to, just chop them up a few times really. Again, just try to keep your other hand away from the blade as much as you can. We just chop them up into not tiny bits, but just reasonably sort of medium-ishy small bits. Um, like that should do really. And then again, you just chuck them in the sieve along with the um, mushrooms to have them rinse in some cold water. Uh, just, just give me a moment while I just do that. There you go. All right. Okay, good stuff. And just get just rinse them about. And while you're rinsing them in the corners or the sieve, maybe just uh, give the sieve a quick shake while you're rinsing them under the tap of cold water. Now, after doing that, I've taken out the sausages and they are a little bit overdone on my end. Um, they, I put them in for about 25 minutes. Usually I recommend putting the sausages in for about, uh, I'd say probably... 20 minutes really if you're doing it at 250 degrees if you're doing it at slightly less than 25 minutes probably is slightly wiser but um these might look quite bad on my end because they do look a bit burnt it's obviously not as bad as it looks and the good way of actually doing the sausages in the oven is that you are able to remove a lot of the grease um from sausages because they are quite naturally greasy meat so I'm just going to sort of quick, take a quick nibble it of that. And the good way to tell actually when a sausage is cooked is if you place your finger inside of the flesh and uh, it's hot, which um, fortunately it is. So what I'm going to do now, just cut them up into little bits. Like I said, I was a bit stupid. I did leave this in a bit too long at the heat I was doing them, but 
it's not going to be too bad. Not the end of the world. They're not really low grade sausages, these. I got these for um, eight for £1.50 at Sainsbury's. They're not most high grade sausages, but they're not bad either, really. So they're quite good for things like these and um, also for directly eating them, like in a sausage sandwich or something or um, a fry up. So I definitely give these a recommendation. The ones I got was British pork and herb, but um, Sainsbury's do a diff few different flavours of um, pork sausage in their. Um, selection of eight for 150 kind of home brand sausages they are quite decent quality to be fair certainly a lot better than sort of those shite um I can't remember what is that branded sausage that's really horrible that they always have at like those kids um school dinners i can't remember which brand it is um another type i wouldn't recommend using actually is sainsbury's basic sausages they are truly nasty. Um, okay, so put that to one side. I'm gonna put these um, small sausages into a bowl just quickly, so we can just get them out of the way safely for the time being, just while we prepare the chicken now. So the chicken. Okay, it's just slightly more preparation than the sausages now at this point. Um, basically, all I really need to do now for the chicken is just open it up. And um, what we're going to do is we're just going to take out the individual bits and just wash them in some cold water. You don't need to do this for just too long, just for a few seconds for each piece of chicken. Um, and you basically just sort of give it a quick rinse in some cold water from the tap again, much like you would do with the... Um, green beans and the mushrooms and just sort of rinse, give it a little scrub with your fingers of course make sure your fingers are very well cleaned before you start doing this and um, yeah just give them a little sort of rub down with your fingers in some cold water or, or rather under some cold water tap or such and then again just do that to the rest of it we've got about sort of three uh, fillets in each handful here so that's about six fillets of chicken breasts overall and that should be enough really like i said again a five to six hundred or so grams of um chicken breast is more than enough really for about four to five servings if you're being really tactical with this um make sure it's reasonably good quality as well because otherwise how can you justify yourself living? Hmm? But anyway, we are going to now then just pretty much what we're going to do is just cut it up and cut each breast bit into strips like that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to cut the strips of chicken from each of the uh, sort of uh, bits of chicken breast into uh, thirds. So show you what that means basically just get eat, get the strips into a bunch here and just kind of like that i'm probably going to use a slightly sharper knife for this because this knife is a bit blunt at this point but um you get my point you just get the chicken into strips and you just sort of slice it up sideways into thirds as roughly as you can if it's not quite exactly thirds, then don't worry too much. It's not the end of the world. So we're just going to do that for each fillet of chicken. Again, I'm not going to show you the whole process of me doing that for each individual fillet. I think showing you just one, uh, showing you me doing it to one fillet is more than enough. So I'll get back to you guys after, after I have prepared the rest of the chicken for dicing up and bonking into the uh into the stew so we'll catch up in a second okay so we're back again now uh what i forgot to mention is that when you cut up all the potatoes and rinse them and put them in you need to leave them to saute for about 15 minutes or so before putting in the washed up and diced up chicken now after you've let that simmer around and stirred it around for a bit about for about five minutes uh preferably with the lid on so that the chicken has a a bit of time to cook 
Um, what we're doing now, going to do is we're now going to add in the, um, the ale. So we just get the um, this tin opener here has a small bottle opener on it. It's a bit awkward, really. So bear with me a second. There we go. Get a nice bottle of Duval open. And basically, what we're going to do now is we're just going to get this and pour it into here. And basically, the reason why we're putting ale in this is not just to do with the flavour of it. It's also to do with the fact that if we put it at this stage, not only does it give the um, the chicken a good chance to sort of um, cook in the flavour of some nice ale, but on top of that, it also gives the ale a good bit of time to pasteurise and kill out all the alcohol germs. So if you have any young'uns, or any people who are a bit who you know a bit reluctant to get hammered, then uh, fear not, young ones, because the alcohol by the time you've eaten this will probably be killed off. Really, the flavour will still be there, so it'll be de tasting nice and good. So as you can see there, the chicken's starting to sort of go a little bit beige, which is all nice and good, and its juices are mixing with the ale to make it all give it a nice little sort of yellowish beige colour, so when we get all the rest of the ingredients in there, it's going to be extra, extra tasty. So then, of course, what we do is we get cannellini beans, and uh, we're just going to uh, get the uh, vegetables, because we need the um, colander now for the cannellini beans. So we just get the vegetables, just chuck them into the ale, chicken and potatoes. Just try and get as many of them uh, done under the surface as you can. If you can't get all of this into the stew, don't worry, maybe try and reuse them as in a soup or in a salad or something like that. Because chances are some of the ingredients may not fit in here. So you don't need to worry too much about not about overfilling it e, which is also why I would probably recommend getting as big a sort of pot as you can really this doesn't require this recipe doesn't require a massive saucepan or pot really but it does help to have a slightly larger one than you would usually cook your average bit of soup in so do keep that in mind so next what we're going to do is we're going to get these cannellini beans and as you can see they're in a bit of water so I'm just going to sort of Get them in the sieve here and uh, just quickly give them a quick rinse to get the starch out. And so now, as you can see here, they're a little less gunky, so we're going to put them now into the stew as well. And that just gives the stew a little bit of oomph and a bit, a bit of, a, a bit of um, depth of perception, so to speak. Then we're going to put in the tin tomatoes. And then the sausage as well, and I'll show you guys this in a second after I've done it all. And that's kind of really all of the liquidy kind of stuff really now done at this point, so it's not going to be too sort of messy hopefully. As you can see this is a bit overflowing, so we're probably going to need to remove some of these ingredients, but at the same time it's doing pretty nicely. Uh, now what we're going to be doing at this point is just making sure that all the ingredients are mixed in together. And this is pretty much as full as you want the sort of pot to be. Um, you will probably want to get it more mixed in than I'm doing here because I'm doing a pretty terrible job of it now. But just so long as you have enough liquid to get to 95% of the way up the pot, you should be all right. You don't want it to really get that far though, preferably, because otherwise it will probably overspill a bit and boil over, which you really, really do not want. Um, I would also maybe mention, if you're really up for it, you might want to sort of saute the mushrooms earlier on with the potatoes and the onions, so you can give them a bit of time to cook. But it's not imperative. You can let them poach in the sort of flavours here. So we've now levelled that out a bit. Um, try and mix it around a bit to get some of the colour in there. And there you go. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to quickly prepare the seasonings. 
Um, I should also mention as well, if it does look like it's a little bit overly full there, what you can do is you can just get a ladle to sort of remove some of the liquid a little bit without, you know, just pressing it down into the sort of the, the stew without sort of um, trying to take out any of the ingredients, any of the, any of the ingredients, and I meant to say any of the ingredients, so to speak. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to quickly pair the herbs, just going to remove the rubber band there. Just quickly give these a quick rinse in some cold water. And you might want to do this over the stew, but um, I'll just show you it here for sort of practice. Basically with the sort of sage leaves or bay leaves, you just rip them off the stalks like this. Very easy and simple. You don't really have to chop these up. You can if you want to, just for ease, because you might end up eating them while you're eating the stew. Uh, so you just do that. There you go. That's all the sage leaves done. Now with thyme, it's a little bit trickier. Um, you can get dried thyme, which is probably a little bit easier to do with. But what I do is I just grab it at the end of the stalk here. I just get my other set of fingers, just run them along and tr just wring the leaves off of the stalk like that. It's quite fun actually, I find. Very, very humorous if you're that kind of inclined towards comedy. Uh, I mean, I know it's not that really funny anyway, but it's uh, it's just quite satisfying really to do that. Then you kind of do roughly the same thing with rosemary, but from kind of the other end. You uh, you grab it instead of from the not from the stem end here, but from the tip here, and kind of just go down this way. A little bit trickier to do with rosemary, but it works roughly on the same sort of kind of concept as uh, what I just did to that sort of stalk of thyme there. So again, to show you here. Kind of grab it at the end, not at the stalk end, and then when it gets to the point where you can't really do that anymore, you just nip off the little bit at the end. There you go. One really, really nice smell actually is a bit of freshly sort of rinsed and sort of pulled uh, rosemary. Actually, I don't think there's very many other smells in sort of contemporary British or uh, pan-European sort of cooking that are really as lovely as this. It's just a beautiful smell. Um, so fragrant and not in like a sort of overly homogenous sort of way but just really sort of quite sort of nicely subtle but just to the point where it's you know just between subtle and sort of like uh, extremely sort of fragrant so it's just the right kind of sort of flavour you want in a nice big pot of stew like this so it's just the seasoning and especially with something like say bay leaves or sage leaves and a bit of thyme it's just the ticket. Um, I'd probably say the, the seasoning though that I tend to use most in a lot of my cooking is thyme, um, just because it's quite an ambidextrous sort of uh, seasoning. It's very easy to use in a lot of foods, including primarily uh, Central and Western European sort of food. Eastern European food does kind of use it a lot as well, but perhaps maybe not immediately as much, um, but still, it's quite an ambidextrous universal sort of seasoning, so I feel like you can use it in a ton of stuff from around the world, so it's definitely a good one to grab hold of. So um, what we're going to do now, we're just going to get the herbs, and we're just going to lump them into the stew here. And what I'm going to do is I am going to sort of remove some of the liquid with the ladle, because it is a bit overflowing here. I'm just going to quickly show you that now because the stew is a bit overflowing, unfortunately, on my end. Uh, it may be like this on your end, which is why I probably recommend getting a slightly deeper and wider pan than what I've got. But, I mean, the one I've got now, it it's not bad. It's never really failed me anyway, so it's, uh, it's a good one, really. Um, so I'm just going to get a ladle here. Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to press it down. Just try and get small increments of that liquid. Try not to get too much of it. And I'm just going to chuck it away. Um, this might seem a bit wasteful, but if you do have a way of storing this liquid, then it might be good to use it as sort of like a secondary sort of seasoning at some point on something else, like say a spit roast or something like that. But I'm just going to sort of take away some of the liquid now and just bin it basically, because otherwise the pot here would overflow considerably. So I'm just going to do that for a bit now, and then after you've done that, you basically just mix in these herbs here that I've just bunked on here, 
and just sort of put the lid on, turn it down to a slightly lower heat and then leave it to simmer at a very low heat for about, I'd say, uh, at least an hour, maybe two hours at the most. So leave it to simmer for between, let's say, an hour to an hour and 50 minutes, I'd say, is probably the optimal range of time you should leave this uh, sort of curry, not curry, um, stew to leap to simmer for. The, uh, the chili con carne was more of a curry than this, so, yeah, sorry for the slight brain fart there. Uh, but yeah, no, after you've drained a little bit of the liquid, then just sort of stir in the herbs and leave this to simmer for about one to one hour to one hour and 50 minutes at a very, very low heat. Um, so that it can simmer and so that the chicken has a bit of time to sort of soak in the flavors while it sort of tenderizes up a little bit and becomes all nice and sort of soft and melt in your mouth so we'll just leave we'll just drain a bit more of this liquid stir in the herbs a bit and then leave it to simmer for about an hour to an hour and 50 minutes so we'll catch up again in a bit and that is pretty much it. I might have overestimated the cooking time for this recipe, really, to be honest. The preparation time is probably, you know, just under three quarters of an hour, but the cooking time really should be probably only about half an hour to an hour. Um, maybe a bit, may, I'd say probably actually, no, 45 minutes to an hour, I'd say, is the optimal cooking time to allow the chicken time to sort of, you know, crumble in your mouth, get to that point where it can just sort of string together and just crumble in your mouth, and that the, you know, the vegetables have enough time to absorb all the flavour and become nice and soft and melt in your mouth likewise. Uh, the other thing I would add to this recipe that's kind of just really optional is when you're about to set left, leave it simmer for that period of time, and in a couple of dollops of mustard, and just you know give that a bit of extra edge of flavour. In any case, I hope you guys enjoyed this recipe. Be sure to check out the video description below, and as always, I hope you will enjoy this meal, and I'll see you guys in the kitchen next time.